can't hear me properly or there's too much background noise because I'll come put through fine. On. Great, thank you. Well, it's wonderful to see, see you all and uh, so many of you familiar faces that, that I've seen on other people's talks, um, particularly on a Saturday afternoon at one o'clock, giving up your lunch. So uh, I, I hope to see some sandwiches and so on appearing <laughs> so that you don't miss out too much. Um, it's, it's a delight to be invited now. I feel very honoured to, to give the talk for the, um, the annual general meeting. Uh, and it's wonderful to, to, to be in the association. Um, I, as Steve said, I, I worked mainly on Phytophthora, but Roy gave a talk on Phytophthora last year, so, so I'm unable to do that one, and I had to pick out some, some other subject to deal with. So I called it Barking Up the Right Tree, which I thought was very witty and clever and, and uh, would be a good headline, and then I, 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 in the newspaper, and then I googled it, and I, I'm by no means the first to use it. So I've, I've, uh, I'm rather disappointed in the title now. So I, I've, I've subtitled it The Intimate World of Tree Bark. Um, so what we're going to talk about is uh, tree recognition from afar, the formation of bark and its different patterns, um, our uses of tree bark, uh, problems with bark and tree bark as a, a habitat. Um, I, it, it does sound a, a, a rather dry subject, but Steve, Steve said he, he would be interested in it. So, so at least I know there's one member of the audience who, who's um, uh, going to listen. I, I've, I've put there, it's an introduction. Um, so, so it's not going to be in, in huge depth about um, tree bark, but really it represents a, a journey of curi curiosity. Um, I've been looking at trees, particularly in winter, and noticed the, the bark and found that I, I could identify some of the trees by the bark. And it occurred to me that um, I didn't know why this was. Uh, so I decided to look more closely at bark as a naturalist, as a, um, and, and this is very much a, an amateur interest in, in bark. But having read it up for this, this talk, um, there's surprisingly little information on it. So I'd like to um, uh, make a plea for more observations and perhaps when you, when you go out, think uh, about the bark and, and what you see there and, and um, maybe we can talk more about bark as a habitat. Steve also mentioned that <clears throat> I'm an honorary director of the Lovell Quinter Arboretum uh, in Cheshire. Um, and live very close to Tatton Park in Cheshire. So, so the slides you'll see in the, in the main are taken from the, both those two places. So you'll get an idea of what both Tatton Park is like and what the uh, Quinter Arboretum is like. The Quinter Arboretum, by the way, was um, originally uh, part of Sir Bernard Lovell's garden, the, the radio astronomer, um, who had an absolute passion for trees and started buying up dairy fields successively and then planting them. Um, he'd hoped to, to uh, plant every hardy species from Bean's book written in 1914 um, uh, and nearly got there, but we've now had so many more varieties, we, we're adding to those collections. So tree recognition, just, just thinking about seeing a tree in winter. When we see a bird in flight or a butterfly flitter past, we can often identify it um, just by that fleeting observation without running through each individual feature. Now, when we look at a tree really accurately, we, we need to see its leaf shape, its flowers and its fruit to determine exactly what it is. But for most of the year, that's not possible. There are no flowers or for deciduous trees in winter, uh, no leaves. But we can still make a very good stab at identifying it from the form of the tree, its overall shape, and also from its bark. So there's an easy one. This is um, uh, uh, the Birch Avenue, uh, the Silver Birch Avenue at the Arboretum. Um, and that's a very easy one to identify, the silvery bark from, from the trees. So you'll notice there the silver and, and I'm sure you will have recognized at a glance that that was the silver birch. 
Now, I'm not much of an artist, but when you go out with an artist, they see so much more. And in fact, keeping a field notebook um, and drawing things is a wonderful way to get more uh, familiar with, with um, wildlife and plants. And I've just put this in. This is the lake at Tatton Park. Uh, one end of it's a nature reserve, so you can see um, black-headed gulls sitting on the fence post looking into the, the nature reserve. But look at that backdrop of trees there, um, the huge range of greens. So you, you, you may think, unless, unless you're an artist, that trees are green, um, the old joke, but uh, the, um, look at that variety. Absolutely fantastic in the, in the summer to see those, those different green colours. Now we can also look at um, the, the different shapes, the form of the, the trees. And I've picked this one out. This is a fastigiate Quercus robo, which is one of my favourite trees at the Garbretum. And here you've got the lower branches sh short of the mid branches. So that's the fastigiate shape. Now, whenever I look at this, I, I marvel at it because how does, does each individual branch know where the others are? Definitely because of the shade so that it produces that that wonderful form. Um, absolutely intriguing to know how, how the coordination takes place of the trees. Now, I say form, but in fact, the form varies with age. So this is again, um, Tatton Park overlooking another mere called Melship Mere. And here we've got um, four different Quercus Robo. So you can see on the right hand side, looking at it, a semi-mature uh, oak tree. Then uh, uh, next to that is a mature Quercus Robo. Uh, and that's the, the shape that we normally associate with the, the oak. And then next to that is a, a veteran oak. And you can see that, that retrenchment, the drawing back of the, the branches so it's smaller than the, the mature tree. So, so in fact, with most of those, except for the, perhaps the one in the left, you would know it's um, an oak tree, but, but form isn't constant. It does depend on the age of the, the tree. And I thought I'd just show you um, two ancient trees. The last one was probably veteranized, but uh, actually I say two, two, this is actually one, one in distance on a winter day, and one more close up. And, and this is Quercus Rober as well the English oak and it shows the characteristics of that retrenchment when it gets smaller uh, the branches die back and it sits in a woodland and is protected by the other trees if you cut down trees surrounding an ancient oak it would probably kill it with the shock of the sunlight and, and so on and um, also there's the, the hollow trunk uh, as, as the heartwood decays and in fact, that hardwood breaks down um, uh, under the influence of fungi and uh, saprozylic insects and so on, and refertilizes the tree. So it uses its own heartwood for, for fertilization. Um, so this tree is about 400 years old in the Arboretum. Um, we've now fenced this off or put ropes around it to stop soil compaction, but. Uh, um, we also had trouble with visitors um, depositing their dog poo bags in, in the centre of the tree. Um, uh, it doesn't look like a bin to me, but uh, that's what people were using it for. So, so it's now much better protected. But very interesting seeing the form of a, an ancient tree and, and uh, um, it can last a couple of hundred years in that, in that ancient form. Now, the form of the the trunk actually gives you a, a good idea of how the, the tree has grown. So this is a Dawn Redwood, the tree that was thought to be lost, but was found again, Metasequoia glyptus triboides. Uh, and you can see here the trunk um, has spirals going up. So, so the tree uh, revolves at its meristem at the top, producing this spiral structure. So just looking at the trunk there gives you a a clue as to how the tree has grown. Um, and again, it's helpful in identifying it. Spirals are, are quite unusual in the, in the trees. 
And that's a, a, a picture drawn back of the, the Meta Sequoia, the Dawn Redwood. So you can see, see the typical coniferous shape of, of the, the tree there. Now, when you look at the bark, um, you can see that uh, it shows very much of the, the story of the tree, how, how it's gone on sitting there and who's visited and so on. So this is a, a sweet chestnut and it shows all sorts of scars and novels and, and so on, which is evidence of the trunk repairing insect bites when it was younger. So it calluses around it, cuts that have, have re, um, uh, the wounds have filled in and um, also epicormic shoots, shoots that just come out of the side of the tree uh, growing there. Some fall off and, and they, they leave scars behind them. So it's fascinating to look at the, the trunk of a tree and wonder at the last two or three hundred years and what may have happened to it in that, that time. Now, uh, this is a, a, another birch. Um, and as I said, the bark can be a very good identifier of the tree, um, particularly in, in the winter when uh, the tree form, the bark and the buds are um, the most useful characteristics. But they, they can't, um, they're not as, as good as using the flowers and, and the fruits and so on. This is actually a, a Himalayan birch, um, Betula usilis, variety Jack Monte. And here, just by comparison, I'm going to run through some slides of, of bark just to give you a, a view of how different they are. So this is a, a beech, a native beech, Vegas sylvatica. And there you've got the silvery, smooth bark of the beech. And I'm going to come back to that um, smoothness later on. Lots of tropical trees are, uh, have smooth bark. Um, because of the heavy rainfall in, in rainforest, so the water just runs straight off them and they're less liable to fungal infections when that occurs. Now this is slightly spiralled as well, but heavily ridged, and I'm sure you'll recognise that as a, a sweet chestnut. Uh, and we have some fantastic sweet chestnuts with enormous girths, uh, wonderful trees. Now, as I said, you really need the, the fruits and the flowers and the leaf shape. Um, and the genera differ between species. So just by comparison here, I've got Quercus rubra, the red oak on the left-hand side, and that's not as ridged uh, as the pedunculate oak, or, or sometimes called the, in the English oak, the Quercus roba, where you can see the, the bark's heavily ridged, but almost in cubes or rectangles of bark. So again, you need to get familiar with the trees in the summer and then see the, the bark uh, as your identifier in the winter. Now there's a, a sorbus, that's actually a variety, Joseph Rock, which is a very common garden tree. Um, and that's got smooth bark, but then you can see little novels on the bark which are the lenticels, the way that the, the tree breathes through, through the bark. So, so here in the sorbus, you've got very prominent lenticels within that smooth bark. And that's uh, one of my favorite trees in the Arboretum, another huge tree, um, a sycamore. And uh, that's just next to our <clears throat> newly restored pond. So you can see yellow tape around the, the, the pond to stop um, uh, visitors trampling on it. We, we uh, Just as an aside, we had the, the pond um, restored this year. It had, uh, had um, reed mace in that had penetrated the clay lining and it had drained and just become a, a waste area. So we've had it put in. Um, unfortunately, we had to fill it with um, uh, tap water and it's on sandy soil and there, there are no ponds nearby. Uh, so it, makes quite a useful habitat but within a week and um, this was in March we had newts in it and then uh, thousands and thousands of frog tadpoles um, within again about another three weeks so so wonderful recolonization of that that lake 
which hadn't been there for some time. Now, some barks are, of course, decorative. And this is Asa Davidii. Um, and that's very distinctive. It has reticulate bark or snake bark, and it's often called a snake bark maple. Um, again, very easy to identify that, a green color, those synthesizes, but with those gray stripes down, wonderful tree. And you probably recognize that immediately, the very smooth bark of a eucalypt, um, but giving that, that blue tinge, blue gum. I, I'm sure a lot of you have been to Australia, but uh, when you arrive, you realize just how different a place it is by the, the, the eucalyptus trees that give a completely different feel to, to the country, uh, to our, our woodlands. And here's again another very distinctive bark. Um, this is a particular cherry, uh, a Japanese variety. But again, you can see smooth bark, but long lenticels, which are quite prominent on that, a reddish color. So the lenticels here are the distinguishing feature of the bark. <clears throat> so um, although conifers have uh, foliage, usually during the winter, um, it's interesting to see the distinction between those barks. So I'm just going to run through a few slides to show you how, how different barks of, of conifers are. So that's, uh, uh, we, we don't quite know what species that is, but it's an abiase, a fir. And you can see there it's, it's abscised the lower branches. And then it's got concentric rings around the abscission site. Um, so very distinctive in, in the pattern there. That's a false cypress, uh, uh, quite a smooth bark, but ridged. Um, very reddish color and, and smooth to the touch. So again, very different from the fur that we've just seen. That's uh, a spruce. Spruces have um, very interesting bark. They kind of a bit like a, a maple almost. Um, so this is the, the um, Caucasian spruce, Picea orientalis. And you can see that it flakes off those distinctive patterns. That's another spruce, um, not quite as prominent in, in the, the shape of those pieces that flake off, but you can still see a, um, uh, the, the pattern, but that's a, I see a Rubens, the, the red spruce. And there you've got the reddish tinge to the bark. And here's a Douglas fir, which almost looks like a sponge. Uh, put one from a slight distance and one much nearer um, and it almost looks decayed when you get close to it but um, certainly a tree to to look out for for the bark very interesting bark and of course the the tallest tree in the the British Isles not not native but um, the planted ones have grown in Scotland to be the, the tallest tree in the British Isles and that's Californian redwood um, uh, lots of people will go and punch those just so they don't hurt their fist because it's so soft and you can see that it, it forms these fibers which flake away very very different from the furs we've just seen and that's a, a red cedar quite similar Fuji to the false cypress we saw before so so smooth bark the ridge but when you run your hands down it um, always important to hug a tree to get to know the bark and uh, there it is now I put this in um, because not all the things you see on an outside of a, a tree will be bark this is a palm and palms of course are, are monocots uh, and this is what you'll see on the outside, almost like cloth. Um, and this is called fibrillum. Uh, and it's actually where there were leaf sheaths. Leaves come out of them. And when they decay, they leave the fibers behind. Um, and I remember going on a, a walk once with a botany lecturer who had uh, an idea that this was the uh, where the idea of cloth came from. 
with the warps and the wefts. I, I'm not convinced that cloth particularly originated on, on islands with palms, but uh, I thought it was very nice theory and it, it's always reminded me of the, the cloths whenever I look at the, the fibrillum on a, a, on a palm. So by going through those slides, we've looked at the huge differences that there are in bark, but why are they different? What's going on with them? And what is bark on woody plants and how is it formed? Now, I said there wasn't very much work on this uh, and it's quite been reasonably difficult to find out about it. Um, now it's said that studies on bark aren't as extensive as on other plant tissues because it's very difficult to section them, to put them under the microscope. And also there's very little commercial use for most barks, it's normally thrown away. Uh, and therefore don't, people don't study it as much as, as the wood. But anyway, there are, there are some reports. So this is a, a diagram of the um, uh, section of the outside of a, a, a stem with bark on it. So I don't know if you can see my pointer going up and down. Does that come out on your screen? Um, so we have a, here a cambial layer. The cambium, this is the vascular cambium there, is a, a layer of dividing tissue. And it divides upwards and downwards. And then we have a, another layer here, which is called the phalogen. And this is a, a, a cambial layer as well. So this is dividing tissue um, and produces tissue above and below. So this vascular cambium here divides to produce the xylem on one side. And xylem, of course, carries the, the water up the tree to the leaves from the roots. And then on the other side is the phloem. And the phloem transports the nutrients, the, the photosynthetes, down from the leaves. Um, and then above that are, is a layer of cells which are parenchyma. So um, these are, are multifunctional cells. Uh, they form the body of the tree, really. Now, three layers here, the phelum, which is above the phelogen, the, the dividing area, that's um, parenchymatous as well, parenchyma cells. Now they head outwards to the outer side of the tree and die off. Uh, but they're also subrenized, so they, they uh, uh, have cork in them. And of course, the cork oak is, is a particularly good example of that. And then at the top of the phelum, you, you have a really compacted layer, which is, is the outside of the bark. Now, the phelum, the phalogen, and the phaloderm there form a, a layer which is the outer bark, in, in essence. And that's also called the periderm. So, so um, that's what the, the cellular picture of the bark looks like. Um, it was quite in, enjoyable doing this. I don't think I'd done a botanical drawing of cells since I was an undergraduate. So it took me back uh, producing that. So just a, a schematic there, um, the phalogen, which is the cork cambium that I, I showed you, divides to the outside and that gives the phelum and that dead area that we can see. When it divides to the inside, it gives us that parenchyma, the, the um, uh, non-specific tissue, which is the phaloderm. And then that inner layer, the vascular cambium, divides to the outside, giving us the phloem, transporting the, the leaf products, and to the inside gives us the, the xylem. It's called secondary phloem and secondary xylem because um, it's produced later on. We'd have primary in, uh, when it divides from, from new, new um, meristems at the tips of branches that they grow. But when it, when it becomes woody, it's secondary phloem and secondary xylem. And um, here is a section through a one-year-old Quercus stem. So you can still uh, section it. And you can see here, um, the secondary xylem, cambial layer, secondary phloem, these parenchymatous tissues in the phelum, 
this phalogen layer and the phaloderm on the outside with the, the corky tissue there. So that's um, a very pretty picture of a, a stem. But having shown you that, that doesn't really explain why they've got different bark patterns. So I, I thought I'd look into this a little more. And there's surprisingly little written about this. Uh, lots of people notice the different patterns, um, but it really needs a lot more work done on it to explain it. Now, the best known study is from uh, T.C. Whitmore, uh, who published in 1962. So I found the, the old copy of this paper, A New Scientist. And it says, it's entitled, Why do trees have different sorts of bark? So what Whitmore said was that the periderm, so that outer bark, with its dividing phylogen, so that layer of cells that divides inwards and outwards, are arranged in different patterns and different species. So they're actually not continuous as the, the tree gets older. Now, the outer phylum, cells die in it uh, to make that compact cork layer at the surface. So once they're dead, the cells can't divide to, to um, fill up gaps as the girth of the tree expands inside. So as the, the new annual rings are put in, it can't expand. And that's why fissures occur on the tree. Also the dead cells on the outside shrink as they dry out and that causes further cracking of the bark. Now he used two examples. One was oak, and I showed you a picture of the English oak with its deep ridges and, and cubes. And Whitmore found that the, the oak had a number of periderms which arranged in nearly parallel lines. And that's why you get those ridges and then fissures in between. Um, and then the cubes occur because the cells dry out and you get the cracks across between the periderms. So the outer bark, he said, is under expansion strain and that's why it becomes ridged. Now in comparison, he said the beech has a single periderm which wraps around the whole of the tree uh, and therefore it continues dividing. You don't get these gaps in it and so the bark is smooth. Um, also, the, the layer of phalum, that outer dying cells, is much thinner in the beech. Um, so it's not under as much strain as it is in the oak, and therefore you don't get the, the cracks uh, quite as much as you do in the oak. So that's, that's Whitmore's explanation, um, but definitely needs a lot more, more investigation, I think, than that. Now, uh, young branches and paper bark are an interesting example. Um, so the young trees don't have the, that enormous girth, so they're not expanding proportionately as quickly as the older trees. And so they tend to have smooth bark, they're not as ridged. Also, as the cells die on the outside and the tree expands, the outer bark might actually come off. Um, and in things like the, the, the paper bark birch, it comes off at the same rate that new bark is produced. Uh, and when you've got a smooth periderm underneath, it comes off in sheets. Um, uh, where in other things like the London Plain, um, there's a different periderm pattern. And although it sloughs off, the bark comes off in scallop shapes. So it all depends on the periderm pattern and um, the rate of death of, of the outside cells and, and how thick the phelum is. So I just put that in there. Uh, this is a, a pear espalier, um, uh, which is pruned back. And you can see the stock of that um, is quite old bark, but it's been pruned back. Um, so there's the ridged bark, but here are the new shoots growing going out, which aren't as, under as much expansion strain. And you can see very clearly the smooth bark of the pear here and the ridge bark of the, the uh, older tree there. And there's higher up that picture of the um, uh, Jack Monti silver birch. And you can see there the peeling off of sheets 
um, as you've got the new bark underneath, the outer dead cells flake away in, in sheets. So that's how you get the, the paper bark and build um, canoes out of bark. Now the tree also differs slightly in, in the content of that phelum layer. Uh, so you've got different um, frequency of fibers and also hard um, cells called sclerids. Uh, so I've just put, for example, here that um, Californian uh, redwood again, um, here with its fibrous bark, and here's a, a big leaved magnolia. And you can see that's a really tough bark, um, very, very solid, like iron to try and saw through. Uh, and that's because it's uh, one, one here's got lots of fibers, we'll peel off, but this is full of much, much cork and sclerids and so on that make it much tougher. Now, just a, an old um, tree stump there, uh, hit by lightning and peeled away. Um, just showing you the different parts of the tree. So in the center there, you've got the heartwood, which is dead wood. And that's why in the veteran tree, um, that can decay without any damage to the tree at all. On the outside, uh, you've got the, the sapwood, which is the xylem where all the, the um, water is going up and the, the flowing on the outside. And then um, in this old, a decaying tree, you can see the felons coming away from it. So it's very distinctive from the outer bark. Um, and just up at the top here, you can see that in this tree, it was just beginning to start the decay of the heartwood. And again, sawing through a, a tree, you can see here the, the different patterns. So here you've got the xylem, then a line of cambium here, then the phloem, and then the periderm up here. So quite distinctive when you saw through it. I didn't saw through it, this was just a trunk I found. And I just thought for, for information I'd put in um, something about the annual rings that form. So, so here we have the, the outer uh, phloem areas, but here we've got successive xylem rings. And you get annual rings because of the xylem patterns. The, the phloem is always pushed out to the outside, but the xylem, the water carrying vessels, are in the, the inside. So the annual rings occur because of different growth rates uh, during the growing season from spring to autumn. So in, in, the, um, uh, in the spring, the vessels are larger and they're thinner. Um, so you can see here, but when it gets to the late wood, they're smaller and thicker. And very late on, you get this very thick layer. And that's why you get what appears to be rings. It's just differential growth rates as we go through the year. I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but I enjoyed that slide, so I put it there. <laughs> so we've talked about trees, but I thought it'd be interesting to just mention why, why a tree does have bark. So we've talked about the periderm, that outer bark, uh, which is corky, uh, and technically that's known as suburanized. Some people say suburized. Um, super, of course, being the Latin for, for cork. And it contains tannins, which um, act against uh, uh, invasive species like um, the fungi. Um, as we've seen, it's, it's dead and forms this, this cork waterproof area, so it prevents water loss from the trunk. It protects against some pests and diseases, and uh, the cambial regions that I showed, the phalogen is very active in wood repair, so if the bark does get wounded, then it does repair. Um, it provides some physical protection, for example, against fire, and some protection against cold and heat as well, so it does act as insulation. Now I showed you a number of slides, particularly the cherry and the uh, sorbus, and we have the lenticels there. This is a section through a lenticel. This is how gases get into the, the lower cells, which are still alive here, so they can carry on metabolizing. Um, this is a one-year-old oak stem, 
and the phylogen, that dividing area, is much more active here. So this keeps keeps growing out, uh, and so the gases can get in. The cells are less compact, but it does provide a rather vulnerable point also in the bark for for things to enter. But that's the section through through the uh, lenticel. Also in the the outer bark, we might have other protective mechanisms like these resin ducts. So this is in a pine and you'll know from um, wounds on pines that all the resin comes out of here and seals up the wound to stop fungi and so on getting in. So the, the resin ducts here provide protection for the tree. Now humans use bark as well. Um, uh, this medicine and I, I'm sure we're all familiar with quinine which was used as an antimalarial um, drink. Uh, uh, and this is from cinchona pubescens. Uh, there are other familiar things to you, witch hazel ointments, which come from the bark of the witch hazel, and salicylic acid aspirin coming from salix bark. And there are stories of willow pools when the animals gathered around and drank the, the salix water. Um, and it's said to relieve any, any pains. I don't know whether that's true or not, but um, also spices and flavorings. So cinnamon comes from uh, uh, the bark of the cinnamomum. Resins for retsina and rubber uh, is from tapping the, the latex out of um, the rubber tree, the Via Brasiliensis. One of the longest uses of, of bark is for chemicals and that's for taking the tannins for tanning leather. And we use barks now within agriculture and horticulture as mulches, put them on the soils to retain moisture and to um, uh, suppress weeds. I put two examples here. I was very lucky to find a cork of Moet Chandon to show you, but uh, um, those are composite corks uh, from, from the the cork tree uh, in Portugal. Portugal, Portuguese people often call the cork, cork trees, it's Portuguese oil because it's such a valuable resource for them. And I've also put there at the bottom um, a piece of material called tapa or massi, um, which is uh, made from bark and used as clothing, but also table cover coverings and mats. And that's a typical pattern from Fiji, where, where tap is made most frequently, and it's, it's uh, a, a tremendous Fijian art form, the, the weave, weaving of bark into tapa. Now, I was bound to come to pests and diseases at some part. Um, now, the outer bark, the felon and its dead cells, don't have protoplasm, so there's nothing for biotrophs those organisms that feed on living tissue, um, nothing for them to eat. And the subrin, the cork, and the resin provide a barrier. And there are also no uh, what are called symplastic pathways, um, which are pathways enclosed by cell membranes through which water and solutes diffuse, and viruses can enter through those pathways. They don't exist in the, the dead cells, so a good barrier against viruses. However, wounded bark does allow pests and pathogens to enter the living wood. And there are some that can penetrate the intact outer bark as well. So this is uh, not established in the UK yet. Um, it has been found on a couple of occasions. Uh, but this is the Asian longhorn beetle that has a very wide um, host range of trees. Now, I put this in because it's, it's one of these things that we have to have um, biosecurity measures at ports and people have to be aware of not bringing things in, in packaging and so on. Um, and it's really important because these things are absolutely devastating. Uh, attacking Europe and we, we, if they got in, we'd see similar things to the ash dieback occurring. The Asian longhorn beetle can come in on, on trees, so it's best not to import 
trees and grow them in this country instead. But they can also come in in um, packaging like wooden pallets. And I've even heard of reports from the plant health inspectors of people finding things coming out of their new sofa uh, because they've been built of, of wood from, from Asia without being sterilized and then um, these things come out. So it's so really, really important that we follow biosecurity measures and, and us as naturalists have a responsibility, I think, to try and make people aware of these biosecurity measures and just how uh, desperately important it is that we, we enforce them and try and keep these things out. So you can see the longhorns uh, of the longhorn beetle there. This is another one, emerald ash borer, uh, which can penetrate the bark. The larvae uh, hatches eggs laid on the bark, and then the larvae burrow into the bark. Um, these have uh, added to ash dieback in the United States and um, are absolutely devastating the, the ash populations. Again, they come from uh, Asia. Uh, we, we don't have them. Uh, and are desperate to keep them out, pretty as they are. Um, this is another one which we don't have, but it's causing a lot of problems in the United States. This is the bronze birch borer. And uh, like a lot of these bark beetles, the larvae form galleries. They eat through the, the living wood and form galleries. And here you can see quite characteristic symptoms on the white bark where callous tissues formed um, by the wound repair mechanisms. Um, another example here is uh, uh, an interesting one, which is insect damage to, to beech trees. This is beech bark disease. This is a picture from the United States. But it's not really the, the insect in this case that causes the most damage. It's the, the following infection by Nectria fungus, a particular variety and other saprotrophs, which cause this um, uh, damage, attempted wound repair, and eventually death of the, the tree. But it's the insect penetration through the bark that allows access to that. Now, we're all familiar with the Dutch elm disease uh, that killed off the majority of our elms, and the elm bark beetles, which um, several species, species of Scolitis. But I don't know how many of you will have come across yet the great spruce bark beetle, which is spreading across the country. It's still notifiable, so if you find it um, uh, uh, APHA, <clears throat> the Animal and Plant Health Agency should be contacted. But that's um, the Dendroctonus micans beetle. Now it has come into Tatton Park. Um, this is uh, bark which has been lost because of the galleries forming underneath. But you'll see quite big holes in this, this tree. And this is what first alerted the gardeners to this infection. Uh, and the, the tree's just covered in these holes. And it was woodpeckers finding the larvae. Um, and uh, uh, the, the woodpeckers find the larvae first. Uh, and then the, the bark started falling off. So that's the, the great spruce bark beetle. And um, yep, I did have to mention Phytophthora. Uh, this is Phytophthora remorum, which is swept across Wales and other areas, um, carried in, in water droplets. I said I, I had to mention this as a, a a, a disease, of course, Phytophthora is not a fungus, it's a water mold, and it has swimming zoospores. Uh, and they can actually penetrate the bark from water which is held in the bark fissures. Now, um, it mainly attacks larch. Uh, it's supported by its, its um, other host, Rhododendron ponticum. So if there's Rhododendron ponticum around, then um, uh, it's likely to spread this, this disease. It can be reduced by, by thinning the rhododendron uh, and reducing humidity, but um, 
trees that get this are subject to statutory plant health notices. And there've been something like 12,000 hectares in Wales already notified. And it's, it's um, altered the landscape significantly. Here's another fight off through a water mold um, showing fairly distinctive symptom uh, called bleeding canker. And you can see here the black marks on the tree where the fungus has, has um, caused uh, holes in the bark and the defensive mechanisms of the resin and damage flow and leak out. It's probably black because there, there are the fungi molds uh, affecting it. But um, again, if you see that on a tree, it's the bleeding canker is certainly something to look out for um, and uh, be aware of when they, when they occur. Now, the outside of the bark also has another name. And um, as naturalists, we, we do like to have as many names as we can, I think. So it, the outer bark is called the writer dome, or it's also called the dermosphere. And that's the, the dead tissue that we can see on the outside of the, the tree. And it's considered to be the, the region by some outside the periderm, so what we actually see. Now, I found this figure here that it's an estimated area of 0.9 hectares per surface area of hectare of a typical temperate arboreal forest. 0.9 hectares per hectare is right a dome. So almost the, the surface area. Now, I thought about this and I, I thought that's absolutely astonishing that there's so much right a dome in a forest. But then I thought, well, actually, I might have been more than that. <laughs> so uh, a huge area. But quote from this paper in 2023 was, despite its vastness, the bark microecosystem of forests remain unknown. So there we are, something to look at. So what inhabits that writer dome? And you'll be familiar with these algae. Um, they often give them the color of the bark as green or orange bryophytes, lots of lichens, and the lichen species um, often depend on the pH of the bark. So alkaline bark of the ash, the fraxinus, um, uh, enables particular lichen to, to live on its surface. Epiphytic ferns, slime moles, and who knows how many bacteria and undiscovered microorganisms there must be there. Just to show you some, some pictures, in the top there's a, a slime mold, um, on the right a mixture of bryophytes and then some epiphytic ferns just coming out of the, the uh, surface of bark there. And fungi, that's on a decaying log on the left, and some lichen on uh, um, pleached apple trees in the wall garden at Tatton Park, a lovely collection of lichens there. So I hope you'll be able to see those at some stage. And what about the animals that inhabit the, the right dome? Well, there are insects, aphids, beetles, including those burrowing, burrowing larvae that we've talked about, wasps, moths hide during the day, and ants, um, arachnids, spiders and mites, mollusks, tree slugs, and tree snails, um, and of course, rabbits and deer feed on bark and bats shelter behind loose bark or were in holes. And there are fungi that we can actually see as fruiting bodies like the bracket fungi on the outside of the bark. Now, um, Lynn Body and Cardiff done a lot of work on this recently. And we used to think that these um, bracket fungi were killing the tree. In fact, she considers that most of them are living on dead tissue. And so they are a, a sign that there is dead tissue in the tree, but they're probably not killing the tree. Um, so it's so interesting to see them rather than a, um, a, a sign that they should be controlled. But there are organisms that know the right of dime intimately I said it was the intimate world of bark, and here's a woodpecker and a tree creeper that could tell us so much more about the writer dome than we know. So thank you very much. <laughs>